This week we're going to pivot from our basic foundational information associated with ecosystem restoration and, and start to look at some tools and techniques that you might use as a restoration professional. And one of the first two aspects that we want to address is biological controls and grazings. And so the purpose of this lecture material is to kind of provide a support for the other videos that we have as this week's lecture um, and this week's material. So in terms of intended learning outcomes, um, I have a couple things that I, I think you need to be aware of as you complete this um, video lecture. And, and the first is that you need to understand the basic concept of biological control and the frequent types of biological control being utilized in different restoration projects. And then understand the importance of grazing on colonization and extinction processes in restored ecosystems specifically. So one of the aspects or one type of biological control that we'll look at is grazing by herbivores. Um, and um, understanding the impacts that that grazing can have on the ecosystem dynamics is an important aspect of using these um, species as a way to control uh, vegetation, primarily invasive species in, the most, ca in most cases. Um, and I'd like you to have an understanding of then, based on some, some ideas about the basic ecology of grazing on ecosystems, is then have an understanding of the use of grazing in different types of restoration projects. So let's start by looking at what is biological control. So biological control is basically controlling the means um, in making use of natural enemies or predators of plants and animals to contain their population. And so as you'll see here in the upper right, this is a flea beetle um, feeding on a leafy spurge, which is an invasive species across many grasslands and rangelands. Um, of the Great Plains as well as here in the Northwest. And um, these flea beetles have been released because they are a natural predator of this invasive, invasive species. And um, as we'll see in, in one of the other um, video field trips um, from the U.S. Forest Service, an idea of how you would go about using these flea beetles to control leafy spurge. And so these are um, a natural enemy or a predator of this invasive plant, and they're used to help control and contain their population. And I think it's important to point out that in many cases, these biological controls are in almost all of these cases, uh, biological controls are not designed to eradicate these pest species from the ecosystems that we're trying to restore. What they do focus on and what they do accomplish is knocking them down and keeping them at such low levels that they're not a problem or not as big of a problem, and that provides an opportunity for native plants to outcompete um, these invasive species that, um, in many instances, have no native predators, which is why we need to um, bring in an outside biological control agent such as a flea beetle in this case. In the, um, the bottom slide is another type of biological control that's seeing more and more uses um, both here in the West as well as the East, um, you know, and that is goats and using goats to preferentially browse on um, woody species and other um, invasive species rather than our natural um, species or more native species that um, may not be able to outcompete species such as garlic mustard or other um, multiflora rose, which are other um, invasive species that, um, if, that um, are big problems um, across North America. And so these biological controls have become more and more popular over time um, as there are concerns over environmental and human health impacts, as well as the economics behind using chemical controls. So um, 
You know, for instance, using um, lots of herbicides can be expensive. Um, plants adapt to those herbicides, which means that they need to um, develop, the, the chemical companies need to develop new and improved types of herbicides or pesticides to um, combat these invasive species. And, and as a result, um, you know, the, the costs have increased dramatically. Additionally, you know, the, uh, using herbicides or pesticides, especially around water bodies, um, can be a big problem with and concerns about environmental contamination um, and how that impacts human health. So these biological controls are being um, used more and more and looked at as a, an effective way um, to eradicate these pest species, often these non-native and invasive species, um, in a way that's a little more cost-effective um, and, if done correctly, um, are those that um, are going to have less of a negative impact on the ecosystem and environmental and human health. So the use of biological control agents um, may be better for the environment. There are some disadvantages, and you need to be aware of these as you're designing a restoration plan or or if you get into the business of, of really looking and, and developing biological control agents. Um, the first is that it is going to almost always require a much more intensive management and planning to use these biological controls than using some chemical-based control such as an herbicide. And so you'll see this when you, you watch the video this week from the U.S. Forest Service on um, controlling uh, leafy spurge in many um, rangeland, grasslands, as well as um, forest systems, is that you'll see that there's quite a bit of management that's involved in planning required to actually implement um, and put flea beetles out into the landscape to, to control biologically these, um, this invasive species of leafy spurge. Um, you'll also see as part of that that it can take longer to see results. So rather than going out there and using some sort of selective herbicide um, where you may see results in um, days to weeks, um, biological control usually will take at least a year or two before you'll start seeing significant results. And that's because of how the biological control is actually or that insect um, if we want to think about it that way, if we're dealing with, say, an invasive plant species where we're using um, a, an insect to, that feeds on these um, invasive uh, plant species, is that it, it takes a while for them to build up their population levels to the point where they can actually start to put a dent into these um, invasive species. So it can take a little bit longer to see results. And then it also requires a greater understanding of the pest and its predators. And so I have these in quotes. And so the pest here is going to be that invasive species that has, is impacting negatively um, the ecosystem that we're trying to restore. So this could be cheatgrass, for example. Um, that's the pest. Um, the predator here is going to be that biological control agent that we're putting out into the ecosystem to actually um, change the predator-prey dynamics or the microbial community that's really going to impact that pest species. And so we'll see this week um, in, in the assigned reading that you know, when we look at cheatgrass, there's a lot of uh, promise um, with a microbial um, uh, material that is a microbe that um, bacteria that's going, that has shown promise at um, controlling and eliminating cheatgrass. And um, this is something that uh, We'll look more in um, in the assigned reading this week. And so there are some conditions needed for effective biological control, whether we're talking about introducing um, some sort of predator that you know may be non-native to this system, such as um, in this case, this um, um, Spathius agrilli, which is an ectoparasoid of emerald ash borer larvae, larvae from China there in the bottom slide. But, you know, we could have those that are going to be introduced from outside of our system. But even if we're thinking about using something like goats, 
um, there are certain conditions that needed that need to be effective or cattle for that matter um, if we're going to use them as a biologically controlled and so we must um, be target specific here so we must have something a control agent that's really going to focus in on that pest species um, and it must be able to survive and reproduce in its new environment all right so it doesn't make much sense to release a biological control agent um, and then have to continually release it what we want to see is that we introduce a species um, like spathius here um, that is going to be able to reproduce and survive in its new environment and then feed on the larvae of emerald ash borer um, that you see here in the top slide um, which is an insect that was introduced from China um, that's had dramatic impacts on um, ash forests and um, the components of forests in the Great Lakes um, by eliminating and, and pretty much causing complete mortality of, of all the ash species that are in these forests and has been moving more and more um, westward and has been found in Colorado and Washington at this point, I believe. So we want to make sure that the biological control is target specific and it's able to survive and reproduce in its new environment so that it can continually, as it develops its own um, levels of population levels, that it can have the continued and long-term impact on knocking down, down the community of this pest species and keeping it at very low levels in the environment. Again, remember, with these biological controls, we're not necessarily looking to always eradicate everything, but we are looking to knock it down to such low levels that it's not a big problem. Okay, and to do this, it really requires an understanding of the biology and ecology of the organisms and the ecosystem. And so when emerald ash borer was discovered uh, back in the late 90s in um, the Detroit metro area in southeastern Michigan, the U.S. Forest Service, APHIS, which is um, a group of entomologists, and it's a federal agency that really deals with um, insects and, and um, insect pests. They've devoted a ton of money and about 15 years of study, including not only understanding what's happening here in our forests in North America, but going over to Asia and China to um, look at the ecology and biology of emerald ash borer and what are its natural predators, um, and then bringing that information back here to North America to really focus on um, finding a solution and finding a biological control. So there's three major types of biological control. Um, the first and, and the one that you'll run into um, in the restoration world most frequently is going to be this idea of classical biological control. And so as I mentioned, this involves traveling to the pest species country of origin, learning about its natural enemies and ecology, collecting and introducing these natural enemies to the location where the pest species is causing problems, and then monitoring what happens over time. All right, and so that's essentially what's happened with leafy spurge and um, flea beetles, is that you know, we've traveled, um, scientists have traveled to uh, the origin of leafy spurge in a raisin plant, um, learned about its natural enemies, um, in its natural environment, in its natural ecosystem, collecting those and then bringing them here to North America um, from Eurasia um, to where it's found here in North America and release them so that it can feed on the larvae um, in the root systems or in the soil of, of the um, leafy spurge um, so that the, the larvae of the beetles, that is, feeds on the leafy spurge um, root systems, which then um, kills them or makes them less competitive than some of the other more native species. And as a result, and over time, we'll see uh, that the leafy spurge community population is knocked down and provides a competitive advantage to our native species that we're trying to favor as part of our restoration plan. Right? Another one that's been quite successful is, is a... Um, a, a plant from um, South America called Salvinia. Okay, and this is a an aquatic plant that uh, 
um, pretty much form, forms these dense mats on in water bodies, lakes, um, and other um, slow-moving water areas. And this is a picture from Australia where it was introduced um, some time ago in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and scientists in Australia went to um, Argentina and Brazil, um, where Salvinia is found, and um, studied the, the plant and observed what the um, natural predators were of Salinia, Salvinia and brought them to Australia and um, for the last 25 to 35 years have seen and observed great success in combating um, the spread of Salvinia and actually have taken examples um, like this small lake or wetland um, in a, embedded in a, a grazing landscape of Australia and um, a grassland ecosystem of Australia and you'll see that uh, um, they've knocked this back to a level where it, it's barely even noticed in this ecosystem. Right? There are also um, several other types of biocontrol agents that um, uh, have been failures and, and one of the most classic ones here in the United States is, is um, the release of, of the mongoose in the pineapple plantations of Hawaii um, really to combat um, rat populations that were out of control. And so um, in the uh, Caribbean, mongoose was um, very active and used quite a bit. Um, it was you know, found there and um, they basically, without much information in terms of understanding the biology and ecology of, of the uh, mongoose, um, have seen dramatic increases in these species and um, have seen concomitment or, or declines um, at the same time in unintended species, including many ground nesting songbirds. Um, and a large part of that and part of the failure was um, the lack of understanding of the feeding habitats um, where the um, rats are primarily nocturnal that the mongoose was released to um, try to control those populations. Um, the mongoose is more of a diurnal feeder and as a result it also has these um, claws that are not retractable and it um, can really climb well and, and um, feeds heavily on songbird eggs which has caused a dramatic decline in many of the songbird populations um, on several of the islands um, in Hawaii. And so Again, this is an example of where we didn't really understand um, the ecology and biology of, of the pest, in this case, these rats that were in these pineapple plantations, as well as the biocontrol agent, the mongoose, and understanding that they really were not as good of a fit for each other um, in, many, in most instances because um, the rats that were found in Hawaii are different than the ones found in the Caribbean. Second type of, of biological control um, that you should be aware of is an idea called augmentation. And this is where we really focus on management that attempts to increase natural enemies of a pest species um, and does require continual human management and, and does not provide a permanent solution just like these typical classical biological control efforts. What we're after is, is um, helping to increase natural enemies of a pest, which then will turn around and knock those pests down to a level um, that um, is manageable. And then a third, ty third type of biological control is called conservation. And this is where we identify factors that limit the effectiveness of natural enemies of a pest and changing limiting factors to help the beneficial species. And, and in this case, you know, it may be that there are specific soil characteristics that help favor certain pest species or invasive plant species. And if we can change um, through fertilization or adding of lime to make the soil more um, basic rather than acidic, just as one example, that may um, help um, limit um, the spread or success of a pest plant species and um, really 
um, help through not necessarily by introducing another a, a predator for that, but it just changes the environment, the underlying environmental factors that really then will in turn help and be beneficial to our species of interest. So controlling biologically, um, that primary approach, and this is kind of the classical way, is really to manipulate the predator-prey relationship. All right, so like the leafy spurge and the flea beetle, um, we basically get enough flea beetles out there at a high enough level um, that then they, that their larvae then feed on the root systems of the leafy spurge, um, and then it makes them less competitive. So we basically change that predator-prey relationship. But there's also some really emerging um, science that is you'll probably see more and more of over your careers um, of biocontrol methods. And, and one is, is uh, microbial control, right? And so um, this is a figure from the science reading this week uh, where um, researchers have started to use this weed suppressive bacteria in cheatgrass, okay? And um, they basically, through this bacteria, by introducing this bacteria into these cheatgrass stands, um, they can really knock back the percentages of cheatgrass um, after application to the point where we're seeing very, very little, okay? And that's what you see here. This green line across the top is a control where there hasn't been any of this WSB or weed suppressive bacteria, um, and so there's no inhibition. But then you can see here if we've got a monoculture weed or a mixed stand or wheat that, you know, you really can buy in um, using this microbial control by introducing this bacteria into the system. Um, two years after application, we can go from 100% weeds um, down to 20%, and four years after application, we see very little. And so this might be a very, very effective way um, to, to uh, control pest species in the future, that um, the more and more we, we dig into this and we understand the ecology and chemistry of these systems, we'll have a better idea of, uh, of how to, to move forward. There are other also new techniques that are being developed to manipulate DNA that are explored, you know, as, as really novel treatments. And this is essentially manipulating the DNA oftentimes of insects so that if they're in the presence of some chemical that an annual weed might have, um, then um, or some other crop, for example, there's, there's activity in, in uh, corn and maize um, with this where they're manipulating um, leaf hoppers with the DNA and um, activating um, a part of that DNA or part of the, the cellular structure that when it comes in contact with a specific compound that is associated with the pest, then in turn... Um, the plant has a, a internal defense mechanism, and that's really using micro, uh, microbiology and, and genetics um, to really design different types of plants um, in a way that, um, and modifying them so that they have um, defense mechanisms to these kind of novel um, aspects and, and novel pests that are, are being introduced that the plants haven't evolved with. So let's just take a few more minutes and, and look a little bit at grazing specifically as, as one part of biocontrol because this is um, becoming more and more popular and I think um, is, is a great way to really focus in and on restoration is using grazing. And so um, what you see here are some bison um, in the historical range of bison that goes all the way from the Shenandoah Valley there in Virginia um, down to Texas and then all the way up in the Rockies. Um, and then um, you mix with wood bison there up into the mountains and into the wooded areas up into Canada. Um, and almost all ecosystems um, and grassland ecosystems have evolved with some sort of lar large herbivore. One of the exceptions is the um, large grasslands in South America, Argentina, for example, but it's interesting to point out that that cattle now are kind of functioning in this way as a, a large herbivore. Um, but almost all ecosystems have evolved with more small grazers and things like prairie dogs or, 
pygmy rabbits that uh, you may be familiar with here um, in the inland northwest and in the range areas of eastern um, Oregon and southern Idaho. So um, many of these ecosystems have evolved um, with these specific grazing um, species and um, their impact on the ecosystem can be pretty dramatic and their impacts are things that we can emulate with different types of grazing um, treatments as part of a restoration plan. I think it's also important to point out here that there are differences between grazers and browsers. The first thing is to look to see um, what, what these different organisms eat. So browsers, um, like goats, um, have hard palates. They feed on leaves, bark, other green stems of plants. Um, whereas grazers, such as cattle, sheep, um, bison, are going to feed primarily on herbaceous plants, and they're going to clip the vegetation near the ground. And so you can see that the impact of these different types of, of herbivory in these ecosystems might have dramatically different impacts on, on the ecosystem in which they're, they're living and feeding. And so this type of herbivory is important to understand because it really drives ecosystem structure, which is important to understand in restoration. And we've already spent considerable time this semester looking at that, right? Looking at how um, different group or different ecosystems, um, how their structure and function differ in, in how we need to restore structure, right? And so understanding what type of, of um, a herbivory you have um, is going to dictate the certain types of restoration strategies you might implement on the ground to emulate um, these processes if you do not have these um, species in your ecosystem. And so this, species, this slide here really kind of gets at um, some of the relationships between grazing and plant diversity, right? And here I'm talking about grazing. It doesn't really matter whether we're talking about um, browse or graze. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about grazing or herbivory um, in general. And this is um, some data and hypothesis prevented, presented by Ulf and Ritchie in, in 98 um, that, that uh, many studies have have come to show and, and have supported. And that's, you know, if we look at kind of an ungrazed um, situation here, which you see in the red line, um, along our x-axis we have area. So as we move from, say, a very small area like one meter squared all the way up to, say, hundreds to thousands um, of meters squared, um, or maybe we're talking about a couple of square feet here and here we're talking about 100 to 200 acres. Um, and then as number of species here is increasing along our y-axis. And so if we look at this ungrazed, we kind of start out here at the very low levels. Um, you know, so we may be talking about a square foot or um, a couple of square feet. We only have a few species. But as we increase in area, the number of species is going to increase and it's going to level off eventually. And this is kind of a classic species area curve there. But if we look at um, a grazed system, we actually see that at much smaller scales, the number of species increases much more rapidly over a smaller area as compared to the young grazed areas. Um, but then as you get into larger and larger areas, these grazed um, ecosystems, um, if you may be talking in the tens or hundreds of acres, are going to have fewer species than these ungrazed. And so it's important to understand the mechanisms behind this. And so you could think about this with, um, say, cattle um, in a rangeland where they're maybe concentrated into a smaller area. Um, at that smaller area, they're going to actually preferentially feed on certain species. Um, their hooves are going to um, cause soil disturbance. Um, and as a result, that's going to cause bare ground just from that grazing down and clipping of the vegetation. Um, and so that's going to open up sites for um, colonization by other species that may be in the seed bank or that may blow in on the wind or oftentimes may be on the hooves of the grazing animals themselves. And so as a result, um, 
at small small areas, we see that maybe our, our species richness is going to increase much more rapidly. But over time, um, this is going to decrease. And so um, relative to the ungrazed stand. And, and in this case, what you'll see is that because at larger and larger areas, because um, you know there may be much smaller disturbances and um, it's going to be a much more uniform environment over time at larger scales, that there may be more species in an ungrazed area if we look at the larger landscape rather than, say, at much smaller scales. All right. And so, as I mentioned, it's really important to understand kind of a little bit about and think a little bit about the mechanisms for why this is happening. And, and this is kind of a complex diagram, and, and I've, I've uploaded this paper by Olf and Ritchie from 1998 um, as kind of supplemental reading if you want to dig into this a little bit deeper. And this is one of the figures um, in that, that paper. But really what I want to show you here is just kind of um, a couple of things. So we have a herbivore here. In this case, it might be a pygmy, pygmy rabbit um, living in a, or another type of herbivore um, in a range system. And then here we have our local plant community. And so local here is going to be at that smaller scale, right? And we're really looking at two things when we're, we're looking at this diagram. Um, at the top um, right half, we're really looking at extinction processes. And at the bottom, we're looking at colonization. Okay, so some basic, um, basic ecology here. And so if you have this herbivore, like a pygmy rabbit, um, it's feeding on this local community, right? And so if there are pref species that the pygmy rabbit preferentially, preferentially um, likes to eat on, all right, that's going to result in a decrease um, in, in, um, in local extinction by this grazing, by this grazer, right? So those species that tend to be competitive dominance um, are going to be grazed, and so there's going to be less of them, all right? And then there's going to be increased local extinction by grazing intolerant species. And so here what we're going to see is that um, species that are not um, tolerant of grazing that may have certain structures or reproduction um, strategies that when they're clipped off at the ground, um, they may, um, may, not, may not have reproductive structures that um, or sprouting or vegetative um, sprouting abilities that are going to um, help it um, deal with that repeated grazing. And so in those cases, those plant species are going to decrease. Right? And then there may be local extinction by competitive exclusion as well. So as these competitive dominants that can handle the grazing increase in their abundance and these intolerant grazing species decrease in abundance, you're going to see also added pressure through competitive exclusion where those um, species that are much more dominant are going to put pressure on reproductive pressure and other pressure for resources on those in grazing intolerant species so that they're going to become less and less um, dominant. All right, so that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that as you get bare ground um, from local extinction of these grazing intolerant species, you also have an input of material coming in. So you might have the plant species pool um, from from the plants themselves. They may be here in the seed bank. They may be blowing in. But then you're also going to see colonization from outside the ecosystem or from outside the site um, by the herbivores themselves. They're going to be transporting seeds and disturbing the soil, maybe caught and stuck onto their fur. Um, you know, if you, I'm sure many of you have walked through fields and, and had all kinds of material stuck to your, your, your pants. Or your boots. Um, animals, herbivores are the same and they're going to be increasing the colonization and as they've created bare ground, okay, then they've increased the colonization. 
Um, there's also going to be decreased colonization um, by reducing the species pool. And so that's going to affect this. And largely that's by this annual shift over time in the local plant community as you have more of these grazing competitive dominance increase in abundance and the intolerant species decrease. And so understanding all of these dynamics is going to be pretty important for you um, to think about and understand when you want to design some sort of grazing treatment as part of a restoration plan, right? And then this is, um, you know, just another example of some of the targeted grazing that's in the third video that I want you to watch this week, um, which is some of the targeted grazing by cattle um, along narrow, um, in, in narrow swaths to help create fire breaks in rangelands in southern Idaho. Um, and so these are, on the left-hand side, is an area that's been grazed by cattle pretty intensively. On the right side is one where it's, on the other side of the fence, is where it's been ungrazed. All right, and so we have a lot of cheatgrass here. You can see a lot of soil disturbance from the cattle walking through here. It's dry. They've um, clipped the plants off the cheatgrass down at the ground um, and created a lot of bare ground that, that should over time, um, if the seed source is here, provide many areas for colonization by other more native species that are part of this sage step ecosystem um, that has been taken over and invaded by this um, uh, invasive plant cheatgrass. So understanding these relationships is pretty important. So there are a couple of key takeaways here that I want you to think about and keep these things in the back of your mind as you um, read the material this week and um, watch the, the videos, is that um, herbivores will modify the dominant vegetation by grazing and browsing. They also modify regeneration opportunities of species depending on their tolerance of grazing and browsing. So those species that are much more tolerant of grazing are going to be those that um, are going to be much more abundant um, in the presence of grazers or browsers. Those that are less tolerant are going to be um, less abundant. Um, herbivores also modify the transport of, of propagules, so in this case seeds. And um, we've, we've talked a little bit about that in this, this lecture here where um, seeds can be transported into these areas and if they happen to fall off onto this bare ground, um, then that's a great area of colonization um, for that species. And then I think it's finally important to understand that the strength of the effects um, that herbivores have really depends on the type of herbivore and the environmental conditions, right? And so just thinking back to bison, for example, you know, one of the things um, that we believe um, the presence of of huge herds prior to Euro-American settlement here in the West of these um, large bison is that you might have had um, bison migrations that had hundreds of thousands of bison all at one time and um, the area that they were moving through might have been a mile or two wide and just think about a couple hundred thousand um, bison moving through an area and what kind of soil disturbance that would have and the types of colonization and the amount of grazing that would go on as they were migrating from um, the southern part of their range farther north um, over a seasonal a season. So the effects are going to depend on the type of herbivore, whether they're a lot of them, how big they are, um, and the environmental conditions. And um, it's important to keep that in mind and to kind of always Think about the site itself and then what factors are really influencing the ecology of that site and understanding that um, so that you can use that information and use nature to help you design the most effective restoration plan.